รายการต่อไปนี้เป็นรายการทั่วไปสามารถรับชมได้ทุกวัยสนับสนุนโดยแลกเงินด้วยบัตรเครดิตกสิกรไทยเที่ยวก่อนจ่ายที่หลังไม่มีค่าธรรมเนียมพ่นชำระได้จากธนาคารกสิกรไทยสวัสดีค่ะมองเรามองโลกขอส่งท้ายปลายปีด้วยการรวบรวมบทสัมภาษณ์เด่นๆของบุคคลระดับอินเตอร์ที่มีเรื่องราวและแนวคิดที่น่าสนใจมาให้ชมกันค่ะพยอนซอลีหญิงสาวผู้หลบหนีจากเกาหลีเหนือประเทศที่เธอถูกสอนมาตลอดว่าเป็นประเทศที่ดีที่สุดในโลกเธอพบความยากลำบากมาโดยตลอดและแทบสิ้นหวังเมื่อเธอพยายามช่วยเหลือครอบครัวให้หลบหนีออกมาบ้างแต่ครอบครัวของเธอกลับถูกจับที่สปปลาวแต่สุดท้ายเธอได้รับความช่วยเหลือจากคนแปลกหน้าทำให้เธอและครอบครัวได้รับอิสรภาพใช้ชีวิตอยู่ด้วยกันที่เกาหลีใต้ปัจจุบันพยอนซอลีเดินทางไปทั่วโลกเพื่อเรียกร้องสิทธิ์และความช่วยเหลือให้กับผู้อพยพชาวเกาหลีเหนือ How was life in North Korea like? Um, until I realized that North Korea was the worst country in the world, until I got the answer, it was paradise. Really, because uh, even though I grew up. With constant public executions, no, I saw people dying, hanging, by shooting from when I was seven, and it's really common for us to see the flyers about posted by the government about the public execution. But I thought that's normal life. I thought all world the killing criminals like the way how we are doing it, and then just the people we can't. Say the dictator's name by itself, like Kim Il Sung, Kim Jong Il. It's impossible. We have to put the titles behind their name, like a general or dear leader, something like that. As a North Korean citizen, we can't imagine calling their name. Otherwise, you know, or we just mention about the, any political words, they will be disappeared in the middle of the night. Whole family. A stranger helped you in Laos. I was. Uh, Sitting in coffee shop because the law government at the time, the immigration officer said I have to pay the what was it fine fees per person with U.S. dollar. But at that time, already I didn't have enough money because law is such a corrupted country. I have to giving them bribe all the time, so I spend all the money by that time, and there's no way to borrow money. Because South Korea is not my country either. I don't have any relatives in this world to ask for money. And then I was very in stressed the situation, and then he somehow read my face sitting in coffee shop, and then he just approached me, and then, are you a traveler? You know I don't understand English that much, so with the dictionary we have on the phone we have a dictionary in the phone, so I described the situation, and then he just I will help you. He believed to me. But、yeah, he didn't know I will have today. I can release my book, and he can be the hero in my book. จากการช่วยเหลือครอบครัวของฮยอนซอลีในปี2009 4ปีต่อมาในปี2013ฮยอนซอลีได้มีโอกาสพบกับดิกสโตฟชาวออสเตรเลียผู้ให้เงินเพื่อช่วยแม่กับน้องของเธอให้พ้นคุกทั้งๆท,ที่ไม่รู้จักกันในรายการ i n s i g h t ของช่อง SBS One ของออสเตรเลียเธอถามเขาว่าทำไมถึงช่วยเธอเขาตอบเธอว่าผมไม่ได้ช่วยคุณผมกำลังช่วยชาวเกาหลีเหนือน้ำใจที่มีต่อชาวเกาหลีเหนือของดิกสโตฟทำให้ฮยอนซอลีไม่สิ้นหวังในมนุษยชาติและปรารถนาที่จะช่วยเหลือชาวเกาหลีเหนือคนอื่นๆเช่นกัน What do you want to tell the world about North Korea I want people Whenever they meet North Korean defectors on the street, especially in Thailand, it's a very easy to counter with them. Just to please be like austere man to North Korean defectors. You know, if there's a possibility, you know, just even Thailand people, they can show their kindness at least, right? So that's why I feel this is really important for me to be here this time. 
รองซัวพีนาอดีตกัปตันทีมชาติรักบี้แอฟริกาใต้ที่สามารถนำทีมคว้าแชมป์ในศึกรักบี้เวิลด์คัพปี1995ได้สำเร็จชัยชนะครั้งนี้เป็นส่วนหนึ่งในการทำให้วิสัยทัศน์ของอดีตประธานาธิบดีเนลสันแมนเดล่าที่ต้องการใช้กีฬารักบี้สร้างความปรองดองระหว่างคนผิวขาวและคนผิวดำซึ่งมีความแตกแยกกันมายาวนานให้เป็นจริงขึ้นมาได้ All South Africans, especially Black South Africans, to cheer on for the Springboks. We didn't. It was Mr. Mandela. It wasn't us. We uh, we played rugby, but he was the one that said to everyone in South Africa that they are boys. They're playing for us. I want you to support them, and he took the lead in doing that. So it, it wasn't us. We were very lucky to have him as our leader. You see this cup that I'm wearing. I ask you all to stand up behind them because they are our pride. The image of um, you and Nelson Mandela on the podium together with the trophy and with him wearing your number, mm -hmm. the jersey, that is a historic moment. What do you want the next generation to learn from this? I think they'll learn what they want to learn. For me to be prescriptive um, would be wrong. There's a lot of been said about it, but they have to make up their own mind. Uh, and uh, it's a powerful image for me and for us, and for the people that experienced it. But the next generation, they'll make up their minds themselves if they want to unite or they want to divide. If they want to hold hands and build a better future and a better world, or not. What's the legacy of um, Nelson Mandela that you want the world? to know, to remember. I think the world knows it already. You know, it's not for me to tell the world what his legacy is. They, they know it already. Um, but I think the key thing is selflessness, that he gave so much. You gave everything, you know, he sacrificed so much for, for other people. So that selflessness, um, I think is important. I don't think the world gives enough. I don't think people in the world give enough. I think we can give more. And it doesn't even mean money, it means time, it means energy. Uh, it's, uh, it means listening, so I do think that uh, the world can give more. Peter Knights, ผู้อำนวยการบริหารของ w o w Aid, องค์กรไม่สแสวงหาผลกำไรที่ทำงานเพื่อหยุดการค้าสัตว์ป่าผิดกฎหมายไม่ว่าจะเป็นการค้าหูฉลามงาช้างหรือหน่อแรดวาวเอดรณรงค์ด้วยแนวคิดว่าหยุดซื้อคือหยุดฆ่าหากความต้องการผลิตภัณฑ์จากสัตว์ป่าหมดลงก็จะช่วยหยุดการล่าสัตว์ป่าได้ Never buy products made from rhino horn. When the buying stops, the killing can too. And your weapon to fight illegal wildlife trade is sharp campaigning. Well, yes. Um, you know, traditional conservation is scientists studying um, its uh, laws and maybe um, customs catching people. And I originally was trained as an economist. And what my economics tells me is that if you just try and restrict the supply, you don't affect the demand. You're just going to push the price up. So we have to basically educate people not to want these products. And the way we've gone about that is very much how um, you know a company would try and sell you a product. You know, we've used. Very sophisticated advertising. We've used um, endorsement from some of the top icons in the world. People like, you know, from Jackie Chan to Prince William uh, to David Beckham. Um, all these people that advertisers would love to have in their camp, we've used them to get over the message: please don't buy wildlife products. When the buying stops. When the buying stops, the killing can too. How did you come up with the campaign message, mm -hmm. when the buying stops, the killing can too? I was working as an undercover investigator, so I was doing things like hidden cameras filming um, people selling these things illegally, and I did a lot of work in Asia. What I realized is that the people buying the products, they said, well, you know, the elephants died and someone picks up the tusk. And 
you know, that's what they believe was happening. They believe these were natural byproducts of, of the animals dying. I said, well, actually, you know, not only are the animals being killed, but the rangers protecting them are being killed and the people poaching them are being killed. Uh, the last few years, there's been 300 people shot in, in South Africa over the rhino horn trade. So it's human cost as well as the animals. And people just didn't get that. They didn't know that. So what we wanted to do is, is to link the consumption with the actual killing. Does it work? Uh, it worked very well uh, in that time period I described. We, we got the rhinos going back again. We got the elephants going back again. Then they legalize the trade again. We've got to start again. But uh, in 2011, I think was probably the peak year for elephant poaching in Africa. We started our campaign there. We took the basketball player Yao Ming to Africa and we went and filmed with him poached. He stood next to poached elephants and things like that. And we took that film back to China. We did a massive billboard and public service announcement campaign with the full backing of the Chinese government. Within two years, there was a 50% increase of the people that are aware of elephant poaching. In the last 18 months, the price of ivory has dropped by 50%. And now the poaching is starting to go down. When the buying stops, the killing can too. Satrajan Vina, Sahat Wanla, Nak Vitya Sad Ying Chu Dang Jak Australia, Pukit Kona Watakam Palit Lake Glassi Kiel, Sung Penkan Nam Yang Rod Yon, Time Shai Lao, Masakat Hakar Bon La Hydrogen, Purna Machai Prayod, Nakarbun Gan Palit Lake Gla, Tan Gan Chai Tan Hin. How did you come up with this idea? <laughs> People do tend to think about conventional recycling um, as just that, but we don't uh, have the ability to convert all kinds of materials back into the original form because there comes a point, even with tires, when you cannot continue to use it, for instance, as tires. So if you then say, well, okay, I'll forget the fact that this is superficially a tire, but I'll drill down into the basic elements that it contains. And if you actually start to look at the elements, it's like looking at the beauty within. And the beauty within reveals that there are these elements of carbon and hydrogen in a tire. So if you actually start to do that, then you really start to recognize, I don't have to convert it back into a tire again. I can actually go down and release and unlock those hydrogen molecules, for instance, and use that as basically a beautiful resource. And when you actually open it up in that way, you have created a whole realm of possibilities. I never thought about this before. No, well, you know, that's the interesting thing. I mean, people have, of course, been thinking about recycling mm -hmm. and using waste materials for different things. But I think generally the understanding always was that if you use recycled materials, you're kind of somehow making a product inferior. You're making things worse. And I think people generally still think that. Um, whereas if you can kind of shift that argument around upside down on its head, and you can show that using waste materials can actually deliver you know, higher value products, make the process better, make it more efficient, then it's a win-win situation for the environment and for the economy. Marcus Fry Tag, who got done brand Fry Tag, brand of Pouch, who done Radap Log, Jack Switzerland. Marcus, our Pabai Road Bantuk team, I shy Lao, Masa Mulaka, Dukan Ock Map Tat Yep Mai, Hai Kai Pen Kapau Tete, Talabai, Mi Ekalak Chapot Tua, Dulu Lai Timmy Samka Lui Sak Bai, Letty Sam Khan, Yang Pen Palita Panti Sang Kwam Yam Yun, Hai Kap Sing Wet Long Ik Dui. So this is the original model, the first bag that you created, right. the it's messenger bag. 1993, we did exactly this design of this bag, and that's the one who is extendable. Today we have it in like four sizes, that's mm -hmm. the biggest one, and it's really reduced to the max, which means it's made out of five pieces of old truck tarps, and the function is very high. Here you have like inner tube, from bicycle wheels, Bicycles. and this is as well the seat belt, the car seat belt, which we recycle as well. So I can Except double the size. It oh can no. happen when you're on your way that you need more space. Uh -huh. So you just pull out, right. and then you have like the double size, and you still can go. And how do you carry? 
And this is then <coughs> more like the messenger style. There's also a seat belt. If you go fast on the bicycle, it helps. Did you plan to make it into a business back then? No, as, as a creative person, you always like to start something new. So the production still is really challenging. It's challenging to get enough old truck tarps. You never know how many you can get, what is the price, where you can get it. So it's limited. It was never a goal to end up with a factory in Switzerland, which is also a very expensive place to run a factory. Usually as a designer you design, but now we do everything. We do design, we do production, we set up stores. It's something you cannot outsource. If you would like to make individual products, you have to do it in a certain way and the industry which was existing was not able to do so. So that's the reason why we did it always by ourselves. Your products, since they become so popular, so you need all the materials to produce them, are you pulling these materials out of their life cycles and therefore defeat the purpose of sustainability? Yeah. Uh, I don't think so. So um, it would be too expensive to get the recycled truck tarps if they are not really on a point that they change it. Therefore, I think it's not uh, possible. So I would say it's limited. I would say Freitag cannot grow as big as some other brands because we are limited to the resources. I think it will always be a niche, but I hope that this niche will grow and I'm sure also other brands will go in this direction. มาตินเฮงผู้จัดการการท่องเที่ยวสำหรับผู้พิการของโลลี่แพลเน็ตซึ่งรักการเดินทางท่องเที่ยวเป็นชีวิตจิตใจแต่แล้วกลับถูกรถชนขณะขี่จักรยานทำให้เขาเดินไม่ได้ต้องนั่งรถเข็นความโชคร้ายครั้งนั้นทำให้มาตินเฮงเข้าใจถึงอุปสรรคในการเดินทางท่องเที่ยวของผู้พิการและนำไปสู่การทำคู่มือท่องเที่ยวเพื่อผู้พิการโดยเฉพาะ How do you make yourself accept what happened? Um, it's life. I mean, I think you know, if if you if you have a a positive outlook, then you know you have to take things in your stride, and um, you can't just give up. Although my one life ended, a new life began, and it started up new opportunities. I wouldn't be here uh, today if it hadn't been for my accident. Um, you have to take things. That happen to you, and look on the look on look at the opportunities that they offer you, and not on the things you've lost, but also the things that you gained. So, what opportunities did this actually offer you? Well, I was very lucky because I worked for Lonely Planet for many years. I worked for Lonely Planet since 1999, and after my accident, they were very good to me, and um, I got back to my old job after a couple of years in rehab, and then when the company was restructured. I was given the job of accessible travel manager, or you know, looking into travel with access issues or travel with a disability, and I've been doing that full time for the last three years, um, and launched our Travel for All project, which mirrors the theme of today, which is tourism for all. So I've been running the Travel for All project for the last three years. In terms of um, society's perception, do you think we need to change anything at all of how people view the disabled, especially when they travel? Yes, I do. Actually, I think the 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 the, the um, it's very easy for, particularly for the media, uh, to see disabled people in one of two ways: um, either you know um, sensationalized, kind of oh, it's. So pitying the pe pitying the poor disabled people who can't do anything for themselves, or seeing them as inspirational. Oh, this person has a disability, but they can still do this. Isn't that inspirational? We're just normal people. We're going about our lives in the best way we can, given our abilities, just like anybody else. You know, it's important that 
um, we normalize this whole range of human experience and not try to sensationalize it and not to, uh, not and particularly in terms of disability as I say not trying to say are oh, poor people or amazing people we're just people เมื่อเดือนตุลาคมที่ผ่านมาแจ็คมาผู้ก่อตั้งและประธานกลุ่มบริษัทอาลีบาบาได้เดินทางมาประเทศไทยและได้พูดบรรยายแบ่งปันประสบการณ์และวิสัยทัศน์ให้ผู้ประกอบการรุ่นใหม่ของไทยวินารัต from Nation TV um, your name Jack Ma has already become a legacy what else do you want to achieve in life okay oh. <laughs> Jack Jack no <laughs> I I never thought I'd become a legacy because In, in not only China but in Asia, most of the heroes are dead. The American movies. Mm -hmm. I talked to the Steven Spielberg a few mm -hmm. days ago. Mm -hmm. The American movies. Mm -hmm. All the heroes. They all survive. Mm -hmm. Chinese movies. All the heroes dead. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm not a hero. I'm not legendary. I'm just a normal person. This life. I'm so blessed. I'm so, so lucky, and I enjoy my uh, my life so much. Although I hate this job, I mean, I, I'm not ready for that. So many people focus on me because I'm not ready. I'm not made for that. Nobody have a curricular, you know, career mm -hmm. development for me, mm -hmm. and nobody <laughs> can give me consultant what to go. That we're doing something that never happened. My Original plan was I would go back to teach. That's why I built up a university, and I built up a lot of I built up another school because I was trained to be a teacher. I call myself CEO, Chief Education Officer, <laughs> and I I love to be a teacher. And uh, my life from now, past years, I was making money. From now in the future, most of my jo my job is spending money. To spend the money in the right way, donate the money, spend the money, do the philanthropy things, including entrepreneurship, small business development. I think when we do philanthropy, we should have a philanthropy heart, but business way, not do the opposite. I see a lot of people with a business heart, but f r o n t h e p i way. That will never work. So I would try to do something, spending money, but mostly I love to be on the beach of the Phuket and uh, okay. enjoy life. Because we come to this world mm. not to do things, but to enjoy life. Yes. So I think I just want to die peacefully one day. <laughs> maybe on the classroom or maybe on the beach. Mm. That's something that I love to do, not in my office. หวังว่าท่านผู้ชมจะได้รับความรู้และแรงบันดาลใจดีๆจากรายการตลอดปีที่ผ่านมานะคะปีหน้ามองเรามองโลกจะยังคงนำเสนอเรื่องราวที่น่าสนใจจากแวดวงต่างประเทศให้ได้ชมเช่นเคยค่ะพบกันใหม่สัปดาห์หน้าวันนี้สวัสดีค่ะ